Okay, all right. Um, let's start then. Um, good afternoon or good evening. I know a few of you. I good to see you again. And also welcome to everybody that's uh, new to the conference. Um, we wanted to make a quick follow-up on the block size capital market day and provide you with some additional information. Um, in particular, do a deep dive on crypto assets. Um, we know that the topic on the block size capital market was more about um, capital markets and how blockchain or distributed ledger technology will impact capital markets. That means we were covering um, digital assets, which means, I mean, um, securities being issued on DLT or blockchain, um, but also cryptocurrencies. And today is more focused on cryptocurrencies. Before we start, or before I hand over to Philip, um, I'll tell a little bit about block size capital for those that do not know us yet or haven't um, been able to attend the block size capital market day um, and then provide a quick introduction into cryptocurrencies in particular where do we stand at the moment um, put cryptocurrencies also into perspective um, compared to other assets um, to give you a picture whether this is still a niche or already a market which is i mean um, highly um, interesting or, or with high liquidity uh, and institutional players already trading on it um, quick recapture, um, block size capital market day. We had that in February on the 26th. Um, it's been a very great event. We had over 300 people um, uh, from different industries attending that. And what we try to achieve during that event is um, a, a give a, get to give a very broad picture. Where do we stand and what will be the impact of blockchain and DLT on capital markets? As you can see from the speakers and, and panelists is that we try to not only focus on um, cryptocurrencies, um, but also um, try to spin the loop and, and see how will blockchain, uh, which has basically manifested in cryptocurrencies or proven that it works perfectly fine, um, affect um, existing capital markets. So SDX, the six digital exchange, they've been telling us something about their project um, uh, we had Deutsche Börse there, um, BaFin also um, providing a statement, where do we stand in terms of regulation? Um, and a lot of software providers, as you can see, such as Creologix, um, one of the leading online banking um, providers, Avalok, core banking system provider, Linklaters is law firm. Um, and uh, yeah, um, today is more about really um, looking into cryptocurrencies in particular. A very quick introduction of block size capital. Um, we are a software company uh, based in Frankfurt. This is where our HQ is. We've been founded in 2018, um, and we provide infrastructure for uh, digital assets, of course, including cryptocurrencies. Uh, we already um, provide our solution to uh, a few partners, um, a selection that you can see on that page or a few partners. One of them is Avalok. Um, that means through the Avalok core banking system, um, in the future, you'll be able to trade and manage um, uh, cryptocurrencies and digital uh, assets. Uh, you'll be uh, using our solution for that um, in the back end, um, but your regular access is through their core banking system. We're just simply integrated in their solution. The same with Creologix. Um, Creologix provides online banking solutions for retail and also corporate clients. Of course, there's, there's clearly an interest in uh, trading and managing cryptocurrencies. And uh, in the future, we'll also, uh, you'll also be able to um, use um, cryptocurrency-related services through our backend, uh, which will be integrated into Creologix. A trading technology is a client from Chicago, um, mainly for institutional traders and, of course, the Stock Exchange of Thailand, one of the projects that we did last year um, that has uh, appointed us as thought leader for them. So, in fact, it's very simple what BlockSize does. We provide um, access to digital asset infrastructure through APIs. That means it's a fully modular uh, software as a service solution, as our solution. And um, we saw the need in the market um, to equip existing players with uh, compliant infrastructure to manage and trade and later on also store uh, digital assets. So uh, three simple modules, um, market data uh, being provided through our API, trading services, um, in particular our smart order router, 
that is able to split liquidity and orders um, across multiple exchanges. You'll see after that presentation, you'll understand why um, this is still necessary. Um, and then um, something which is planned to, to be rolled out later this year is the uh, custody API. It's not that we're providing um, key storage services, um, but we rather provide a middleware connecting multiple of those infrastructure providers, which can be accessed through our API. And um, it's, it's for, for retail clients, it's very simple to buy cryptocurrencies. Uh, you simply just open your account on Binance or Kraken or any other exchange uh, and start trading there or through their app. For institutional clients and because of existing regulation, if you just simply look at the value chain or the chain uh, that we have in capital markets um, and the different stations or intermediaries between the secondary market trading venue um, and the investor, it's more complicated. You need safekeeping for your funds, which means usually you'll be using a custodian to safekeep your assets. Um, also, you go through brokers, for example, uh, that provide with liquidity, provide price transparency, and then act as counterparty for your trade. Market data will be provided, for example, through your broker. Um, you're not directly interacting with the secondary market. You go through a chain of different intermediaries that provide regulatory service or services um, in the asset servicing value chain. Um, and this is exactly uh, what we are trying um, to tackle um, and equip those, um, uh, those players in the existing capital market with the right infrastructure to do so. Enough said um, about block size capital. Um, let's have a look at um, the importance of digital assets and crypto assets. Um, I really like that definition, which has been provided by um, the, the Cambridge Center for Alternative Finance. Um, and whenever I speak about digital assets, this is the, the uh, overall concept idea of um, securities and financial instruments or even tokens being issued on distributed ledger technology and blockchain. So a digital asset um, is usually a, um, a specific token which is um, equipped with, with rights or represents rights. For example, the rights associated with a share or stock or profit participation right or any other instrument that you can think of, derivatives and so on and so forth. It's simply using DLT as the underlying infrastructure um, to perform specific functions um, that are stipulated, for example, in the prospectus or, or are associated to that specific instrument being issued on that protocol. Um, so usually when we're speaking about security token offerings, we're referring to a security token, um, we're referring to that as a digital asset. In contrast to that, which is also part of our definition of digital assets, uh, we do have crypto assets. And crypto, crypto assets are um, native tokens that, I mean, they, they, they are inherently connected with the other underlying protocol. You need Bitcoin in order to make the Bitcoin protocol or blockchain work. You need Ether to make the Ethereum blockchain work. So we're referring to Ether, Bitcoin, um, and other cryptocurrencies as uh, crypto assets. Uh, in contrast to digital assets. And um, to put that into perspective, um, on the left-hand side, we see the cryptocurrency market. The current market cap, and I just updated that figure before um, that session, is 209 billion USD. Out of that, it's 134 billion just Bitcoin. So we do have 64% of the overall market cap just um, being represented by Bitcoin. Um, that seems to be a high number, but if we put that into perspective to other assets, for example, the market cap of all unicorns, um, which is 800 billion, it already seems quite small, right? And now, because nowadays everybody is speaking of gold as the safe heaven, and also, um, you might have heard that a lot of people um, are comparing Bitcoin to gold. And um, quite often we hear that Bitcoin has the potential um, to uh, reach the same market um, capitalization as gold does. Gold is nine, is nine trillion USD compared to that. And now, um, if you just remember the slide um, before, if we, if we, and now um, think about digital assets. It, it, of course, the conclusion of that is that at some point in time, existing assets currently running on 
existing infrastructure will soon be substituted or will be issued on DIT. That means all those stocks, bonds, derivatives out there, at some point in time, at least this is our belief, um, will be migrated, will be transferred to a new infrastructure. That means all those assets out there, sooner or later, will be running on DLT. And this is really the potential because, as you can see, the market cap of the MSCI world is 35 trillion USD. This is a market that DLT is tapping into. Of course, the cryptocurrency market still um, still is a niche market and keeps growing um, continuously over the last years. Um, but um, really the interesting fact is here that um, now with that blockchain technology um, uh, getting more and more into the market, we, we actually will start substituting existing assets uh, and then moving from a 209 billion market um, to a 35 trillion, um, uh, trillion USD market. This is just the market cap. Um, also, to put that in perspective of trading volume, um, on the right-hand side, you can see that at the moment, they, the daily trading volume across all exchanges out there is roughly 60 billion. This is um, the, the trading volume that we see as of March 2020. In comparison to the global daily trading volume um, at the moment, and this is a very simple calculation, we're just simply saying the trading volume that we have today for traditional assets, highly liquid assets, will be running on DLT, um, will be represented by digital assets by 2030. We're speaking about a 7 trillion uh, daily volume. So also again here, that simply underlines it's still early stage. Volume is still low, um, but the potential is, um, is massive. The same applies for um, digital assets and the need to store them um, in compliant custody solutions. Also, nowadays, we have roughly 20 trillion of assets being stored and safe kept by custodians. Now, again, um, this will be sooner or later will be running on DLT. So the potential here is that by 2030, which is in 10 years, right, those assets will need new infrastructure, new providers. So again, this is the market potential that we're tapping into. And this is really interesting. Um, the last snapshot I did, um, I used exactly that picture, and that was on the 30th um, of July in 2018. Um, and I looked up the, the trading volumes um, of all different exchanges, the, the, the most popular exchanges, so to say. And I also did the same just before that, um, that session. And you can see that it's very interesting. A few of them gain significant volume, um, such as Binance. Um, it's times four the trading volume, even more than that, than they had in 2018. Same for GDEX, which is now Coinbase Pro, right? Bitstamp um, and Kraken um, as well. And you can also see that some of the exchanges, um, they lost volume, right? So um, the reasons for that, um, it's, it's not completely clear, right? Um, a lot of uh, people actually waiting for consolidation of the market, but I think the message here is that just, I mean, looking at those figures, but also looking at the market caps and trading volumes across all exchanges, you can see that trading volume is going up, significantly going up. But you can also see that some of the exchanges, and there are over 500 out there, are losing volume, which could probably imply that some sort of consolidation um, is happening at the moment, um, consolidation of liquidity. So what is the problem that the cryptocurrency market has at the moment? Or, or why, what, what is preventing mass adoption, so to say? Um, I think the first point is, and, and I showed that when, when I was referring to the value chain um, in capital markets, in particular in, in asset servicing, is that infrastructure is not ready yet. Of course, you do have a few providers, right, that already provide um, secure and compliant key storage of private keys, which we um, refer to as digital asset custody. But this is something which is currently um, being implemented. So there, there are a few solutions that are already live, but still a far cry from what needs to be implemented in order to ensure mass adoption and equip the majority of existing financial institutions with um, that infrastructure. So the problem here is that it's happening, it's, it's currently maturing, um, but um, only a few solutions are, are actually in fact um, feasible to implement it. And also still business cases are, are 
not clear yet. Um, you can't really forecast the volume and associated revenues um, related to digital assets. So a lot of especially smaller banks, family office, institutional investors that uh, want to enter that game, um, they are a little bit um, reluctant or the high capex uh, capital expenditures to implement such solutions, preventing them from, from uh, making, that, making that decision. The other one is that if you try to um, place a 1000 Bitcoin order on just one exchange, um, the threat clearly is that the liquidity on that exchange is not sufficient in order to execute that order. So you could cause um, a flash crash and you could execute that order with significant market impact. This is not something that as institutional trader you would expect from, from trading on secondary markets, right? Or as broker placing an order. And um, we see currently over 500 exchanges. We see that liquidity is slowly consolidating, but still is scattered, split across multiple exchanges. And also there are so many different coins out there um, with most of them. In fact, all assets other than the top 10, they're lacking liquidity. It's, it's nearly impossible for institutional traders uh, to trade them um, in, in a fully liquid way. Uh, and the third point is, um, this disruption or innovation is mainly driven by startups, fintechs at the moment. For them, it's clearly a barrier um, ensuring that they're fully compliant for financial industry requirements. This is an adjustment process which simply, which simply will take some further time. Um, but all in all, um, those challenges, they will be overcome. It's, it's a matter of time. Um, and solutions um, currently being open to the market by, by fintechs will clearly help to make crypto assets more accessible to institutional clients. Now, before um, handing over to Philip, um, I simply also want to give you an outlook um, because the cryptocurrency market feels far more mature compared to the digital asset market, um, which means, I mean, um, security tokens and so on and so forth. I also want to give you some confidence that um, our um, our clear statement that by 2030, uh, more or less, this is something which becomes regular, mainstream in the capital market. I want to show you that slide. Not only crypto exchanges are maturing in infrastructure for cryptocurrencies, but also existing uh, financial institutions, exchanges and CSDs are rapidly moving into that space. So it's not only that cryptocurrencies are continuously growing, it's also that currently major transformations in capital markets um, are being um, performed and executed. So SDX, um, they wanted to go live Q4 2020, or they, they still want to. Um, SGX, um, the Singapore Stock Exchange, is entering that. Our partner, the Stock Exchange of Thailand, they've understood that if they don't do anything at all, um, they will be disrupted sooner or later. Um, one of the first movers, ASX, Australian Stock Exchange, and Deutsche Börse with HQLX, they all are currently working on upgrading the infrastructure. They're all working on DLT projects. Um, and with those CSDs and exchanges being prepared to issue, trade, and also provide um, solutions for the post-trade settlement uh, process on DLT, will uh, simply foster the way and pave the way forward also for digital assets. So um, now the next question is, um, which um, I will leave um, for Philip, is um, is now a good timing um, to invest? And, and um, where is Bitcoin in its current evaluation? Is it the safe haven? Is it comparable to gold? Um, yeah. So Philip, over to you then. Oh, perfect. Um, I know. Thanks very much. And Jeff trying to share the screen. I hope this works. Um, actually, it was the very uh, perfect uh, cliffhanger, so to say. Um, just need to get this technology done. Perfect. Um, I hope you can see my screen now. Does it work? Yeah. Um, No. So now it should work, right? No. Can you can you see the uh, screen? Yes. 
Perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry, I, I forgot to change the title. The title uh, should be different. Uh, but uh, to quickly present ourselves, you know, um, the company Block Size Capital has asked us to hold the Block Size Capital Day. That's uh, with us. That's uh, why uh, we have been engaged here and uh, we are a research institute sitting in Frankfurt. But let's jump directly into the topic. So what is hype and reality out there? Just to give a little bit of a background, what's happening uh, here these days. So one year ago, approximately even a little bit more, uh, Jamie uh, Diamond from JP Morgan said that Bitcoin, in his opinion, is a fraud. Other people joined him. And that's, that's, that opinion actually changed a lot over the last uh, course. Um, many experts now truly value Bitcoin as an interesting asset class, but the interest is the one thing. The other one is whether people have actually started to invest in Bitcoin. That's another question. And very often we at this point of time just uh, see retailers, retail investors having invested in Bitcoin. And my personal opinion is that the institutional investors are very often are still staying at the sideline. But this could also change in the future. Let's see. Um, interest is increasing, but the decision to invest, I think it's still coming in the, in the future, at least on a broad scale. But much has happened, especially in Germany. We have a Börse Stuttgart now since approximately one year being in the market and offering Bitcoin trading for retail investors with their app called Bison. But they also created an institutional marketplace where institutionals can purchase um, or invest in Bitcoin. Then um, the Frankfurt Stock Exchange in the form of Deutsche Börse is also trying uh, to um, think of products related to Bitcoin that's, for example, being done by uh, securitizing Bitcoins in form of an ETN or ETP product and then bringing it to the exchange. So you see here more development coming. And especially, I think some of you guys might know it, in Germany, we have had in, uh, a new law coming up on January 1, which allows Bitcoin trading and cryptocurrency trading and custody for financial institutions and also banks and others, but not just on behalf of their own investing, but also on behalf of third party investors. And that's interesting because then from January 1st on potentially regulatory compliant asset managers and banks can invest in Bitcoin if they wish. Um, for themselves and also on behalf of others. I think that's interesting. Typically, this is called custody business. Um, I typically frame it as the so-called crypto license. But if you, you really have a look at the liquidity of the market, and that's primarily being there for Bitcoin and also Ethereum and a couple of others, then you can cynically also speak about the Bitcoin license, uh, which has been created here because fact by facts and by factual the numbers out there, Bitcoin, Ethereum and one, two, three others are the only assets out there which are so liquid that financial intermediaries and financial institutions can, could actually invest in such assets if they plan to do so. Yeah, but interest is in my mind increasing, but no bank in Germany, no financial intermediary, no asset manager in Germany on a large scale has done it so far. So the law is there, but it still needs to be applied in the future. Um, some people have already written now that Germany potentially could be the next uh, crypto heaven. Uh, that might be a little bit uh, exaggerated, but still you see here that even international media is trying to really understand what's happening here. So let's now talk about uh, Bitcoin in specific. I think this screen is quite much well known by some of you guys. Um, you see that this is basically a list of cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin ranking number one. Bitcoin right now is around uh, 7,300 US dollars. So far, 18.3 million Bitcoins have been generated. We dig onto this in a second. And the market cap is 133 uh, billion US dollars. That's two, three, four larger DAX uh, listed companies taken together. So there is some kind of significance there from, from this perspective. But if you would like to compare Bitcoin with the US dollar as a currency, which you should not do, but if you do it, then of course this market capitalization appears to be very small. In case you look at the Bitcoin price on a long-term perspective, uh, I think that's, the, that's a chart everybody knows from uh, newspapers. You see like these spikes out there, but it's more interesting to use a logarith logarithm a scale on the y-axis. Then you see that there is some kind of upwards uh, trend, um, but you need to apply the log of the price here. Then you see this and you also see that the volume is constantly going up. Even though there has been a strong decline due to the corona crisis, you see this little spike on the, uh, on the right-hand side. Uh, the long-term trend is still 
mostly intact uh, with some spikes up and down, of course. That's now the last three months. Uh, Bitcoin has been developing quite nicely and uh, fairly stable in comparison to earlier times previously. And then you see this uh, strong spike downwards due to the Corona crisis. I think the, the key reasons why this happened is, is that people were panic selling. Uh, and yes, there has been criticism that, P, uh, that Bitcoin is not able to keep its uh, price in case you assume that it should be a store of value. So in case it's a store of value, then this sharp drop should not happen. But actually, if you have an uh, economic crisis, which just happens once every 100 years, then it's understandable that any asset out there, including gold and so on, uh, um, increases this very strong drop downwards. Another reason is that some uh, large-scale Bitcoin owners uh, having leveraged themselves by securitizing their Bitcoins, getting money for it, and then purchasing another round of Bitcoin. So they leverage themselves. And uh, in, in such cases, uh, uh, with margin calls happening, then the uh, uh, potential yeah, securitized Bitcoins have to be deleveraged and uh, then uh, some forced uh, sell-offs uh, have also happened. Plus the panic selling, plus companies needing cash, especially mining companies. That's, I think that's the three main reasons which have led to this very strong uh, drop. But you also see that after the, uh, in the last weeks, uh, Bitcoin already um, recovered a little bit similarly like other stock uh, market indexes. And uh, we are now around a little bit plus uh, 7,000 US dollar. But now let's explore why I actually think that Bitcoin potentially has a quite interesting future. And therefore we need to first explore uh, how gold mines are working. So what you see here is a, a random photo of a gold mine. And you see here that people need to dig into the ground to find gold. And uh, you have equipment there uh, that's expensive equipment. You see a car and some other vessels. So you need to invest a hell lot of money in capital goods to really be able to dig for gold with the gold mine. So how does it work? Um, you have uh, efficient gold mines. That's basically gold mines who have access to the latest uh, mining um, equipment. Uh, you have access to low labor costs. So these highly efficient gold mines, um, they, there are not many out there, but they will always stay in the market. And then as indicated here on the right hand side, you have low efficient gold mines. That's basically those gold mines which have old mining hardware, which have access to high labor cost and which also have access to high uh, energy. So you could also therefore say that on the, on the X axis, the production price of gold is being uh, depicted. And that's interesting because in case the gold price is say 1,600 US dollar, then in theory, the price for producing this gold unit is exactly the price of the gold. That's the theory behind it in, practic uh, in practice. That's of course not happening, but in theory, this is true. And therefore, in case the gold uh, is having a price of 1,600 US dollar, then uh, by theory, the cost for producing this gold was exactly 1,600 US dollar. So in case the uh, gold price, oh, there is an, this F needs to be a D, of course, in case the gold price is 1,600 1, US dollar and the gold mine is operating at a lower production price, then you have a, um, a profit. And now in case the gold price drops, then the gold mine is having higher production costs in comparison to the market price of say 1,200 US dollars. Then this gold mine is operating at a loss. And then what happens pretty clear, this gold mine would leave the market and it would then stop operations, right? This is, uh, and the, the other story around works, works the same way. So this is how gold works. And once the price is increasing, then the opposite happens because then gold mines stay in business. And then it makes even more sense to invest in more equipment to to, to dig for even more gold because the price is so high that even though at higher cost, the margin is still prof uh, profitable. That's for example uh, here that the efficient uh, mining companies, the efficient gold mines, they are exactly uh, on the left-hand side and they will always uh, stay in business because for them the profit margin is even higher. And the question now is, um, that's the analogy which we are very often hearing, is Bitcoin actually dig digital gold or not? And uh, the, the basic assumption here, which is working, is that you have Bitcoin mining going on. That's basically computing Bitcoin. And then there is a, a very long-term weaker effect uh, on the Bitcoin price. I, I will explore this in a second. And you have the other effect, other effect which is going from the bit, Bitcoin price back to the mining. So there is a short-term or stronger-term effect here. So how does it work? Um, you have the Bitcoin architecture, which is basically 
uh, enshrined in the Bitcoin network. And that's basically rooted in the Bitcoin software, which uh, can be downloaded and installed by everybody out there. This then leads to the entire architecture of the network. This then leads in the Bitcoin network, uh, mining companies to purchase hardware, get energy and start mining such that Bitcoins are being generated. The Bitcoins generated can then be sold on the market at a market price and there should then be a profitable margin uh, such that this mining company um, can um, pay for its expenditure such as electricity, hardware and so on. And there should be a profitable margin because otherwise this mining company would not um, continue to operate. And therefore mining hardware of course consumes a hell lot of ele electricity um, in January, there have been 10,000 uh, computing nodes out there um, with 116 quintillions of hashes per second. That's enormously much computing operations per second, which are happening by the network in total. And then, of course, you have a very high total energy consumption um, as high as Austria or Venezuela in January 2020. So, Comparingly to the gold mine previously, mining in Bitcoin works exactly the same. So the, therefore, the rationale is pretty clear that Bitcoin potentially could be a little bit like uh, digital gold. And then you see now exactly the same graphs. You have a mining company in Bitcoin that can be highly efficient on the left hand side when it has access to excess energy, access to low cost electricity and access to the last generation mining hardware that's on the left hand side. And you have low efficient mining companies on the right hand side, that's companies uh, access, accessing conventional energy sources, uh, access to high cost electricity and also having old inefficient mining hardware in place. Again, you have the Bitcoin price being say 9,000 US dollars, then it drops to 8,500 US dollars, such that this mining company is then operating at a loss. Uh, and uh, please keep in mind that uh, in case the Bitcoin price is 9,000 US dollars, then the cost for producing one Bitcoin by theory is also exactly 9,000 um, uh, US dollar in theory. And this money is being spent uh, for energy, hardware, facilities, rooms, and so on. And the same is then true, uh, like with the gold architecture, this mining company, which you will see here is operating at a loss, therefore it will stop uh, mining operations. And on the other hand side, uh, you might have a very efficient mining company. This mining company stays in business and it will continue with operations because even though the Bitcoin price has dropped, it still operates at a profit margin. And the same is true in case the Bitcoin price rises. Yeah? So therefore, this mining company, which you see here on the right hand side, is having a profit margin per Bitcoin and therefore it stays in business. And the same is true, of course, for the mining company on the right hand side. This also stays in business because the profit margin here is even higher. And you see why am I showing you this? Because in my mind, uh, the architecture of gold and also the architecture of Bitcoin is quite similar due to the mining, um, which is happening both in the area of gold and also Bitcoin. There is just one very, very significant difference with gold. We all know that it's a store of value for us it's valuable and we believe in it and because we believe in it we would also invest our money there once a crisis is coming potential inflation uh, is happening on the horizon and therefore we would like to invest in gold now to basically save our value that's basically because we all know that gold is a storage of value and with bitcoin this is very much different because even though the architecture as i have shown you is quite similar um, and therefore bitcoin is a scarce asset still people might not invest into Bitcoin simply because they don't know it yet or because they don't know it yet that it is a scarce asset, right? So therefore, knowledge about Bitcoin has not diffused yet to such an amount that people are now investing in Bitcoin in my mind because they would rather invest in uh, gold and other assets because they simply don't have the knowledge about what exactly Bitcoin is. People are still saying that it's energy consumption, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a fraud, uh, it's potentially money or it's not money. So people just at this point of time don't know yet on average what Bitcoin is uh, exactly. Um, in my mind, Bitcoin is basically the entirety of this entire computing node network, which you can see here on the left hand side. Bitcoin is not just a code. Bitcoin is not just one server, but it's the entirety of this plugged together network of 10,000 
computing nodes. Uh, the same is happening with Ethereum, for example. Everybody can set up a node. Uh, it's unrestricted. Uh, everybody here in the call could set up a node today if he wishes so. Therefore, because it's so openly, uh, it's geographically dispersed, it's happening everywhere on the world. There is no legal body, no access to the government, and therefore, in fact, nobody can close it down anymore at this point of time because there is nobody who can basically, who you can ask to shut it down. It's a large network and the network is uh, interestingly structured because uh, what you can see here is that even though that one country might close down its Bitcoin nodes by some kind of law, the entirety of the network would still survive. Yeah, that's interesting because that's exactly the reason why nobody can stop it anymore. That's opposed to a permission network, as you can see here, for example, an illustration of an Asian network with 50 computing nodes. We have a consortium of banks here, say 50, uh, only selected parties can participate. Uh, the nodes have participants and they have a legal entity, a consortium, for example, which you can address. And therefore, there is a legal entity which is liable and the government can contact this legal entity to shut the system down if required. So you have a more slimmer network and a higher throughput. It's called enterprise blockchain. Uh, and it's underlying the government rules because you can shut it down because there is a legal entity on the left-hand side in these public blockchain networks. Um, you do not have a possibility to shut it down anymore because there is nobody a government could potentially address. So therefore, the question always arises, especially now in terms of crisis, what is the fair valuation of Bitcoin? Um, we have uh, seen this chart already. So the question is always, you know, where does Bitcoin goes to? Will it go below 4,000? Will it go above 10,000? Um, and the, the question is ultimately, are people believing that it's a scarce asset, that it's a storage of value? Um, it is by theory but people still haven't understood it very broadly. So therefore, time is not, not there yet, uh, such that the Bitcoin price is really skyrocketing. I think it will just take more time, more education, more understanding. Um, and it will take especially more institutional investors to at some point of time think about enriching their portfolio by some Bitcoin investment for one, two, three, four percent. Um, that's a similar chart as you have seen previously. So Bitcoin right now is uh, around 140 billion. You see here an, an older figure uh, because the chart is a little bit older when the Bitcoin was uh, has had a market cap of 190 billion. And you see here that even Apple alone at that point of time when the chart was being done, Apple alone had a capitalization of 1 trillion. Gold had that at that time a, ca a capitalization of 8 trillion. Now it's around 9 trillion. And the question is now, to what should Bitcoin be compared? And if, as I have explained, and I think that's also my belief, is that Bitcoin should be best being compared to the gold market capitalization or commodities being out there. And then right now, Bitcoin has a, a share in comparison to gold of two or three percent, depending on the volatility, of course. And the question is always, what could Bitcoin potentially take? What is the fair percentage of Bitcoin in relation to gold? Is it as right now, two or three percent, then the price would be fair. Or should it be five percent of gold or 10 percent or 20 percent of gold? Or should it maybe just be one percent of gold? Then the price would drop. I think that's the question with, which makes sense to answer. But it's extremely difficult to really find an, um, an answer where people are uh, also agreeing upon. An interesting theory which is going in this way is the so-called uh, stock to flow um, model, which has been outlined by a guy called Plan B um, on Twitter, for example, and elsewhere. It has then been also adopted by the Bayern LB in Munich, and they did uh, some computations on it. And what you see here is that the, the, the flow to stock ratio for gold is, again, that's log scale, the flow to stock ratio on the x-axis is around 53 something for gold. That means that the uh, that this ratio, like flow to stock, is being computed. You divide the inflow of gold into the market per year, and divide it by the entire stock of gold out there, and then the ratio of um, 53 is uh, emerging. Uh, stock to flow, by the way. The same is ha you can do for uh, uh, platinum, um, silver, palladium, and other commodities, and then you see. Um, on the x-axis, what kind of metrics the stock, of flow, stock to flow ratio potentially then has. On the y-axis, you see the market capitalization and the researchers here found out that according to their logic, you can dispute it, of course, but according to their logic, um, the price 
in terms of market capitalization is related to the uh, stock to flow ratio on the x axis. That's why you see um, that you can put a line uh, through these markers. And then they have done exactly the same ratio for the Bitcoin in early days when Bitcoin was just out there with not many Bitcoins mined, but with a very, very high inflow per year. Yeah? So therefore, the stock to flow ratio was quite low. You see them. That's why the dots here are on the left hand side. And once Bitcoin mining has happened over years to come and the stock increased and the flow inflow per year decreased, then the ratio again increased such that the bubbles are going more to the right. At the same time, the market capitalization increased. So therefore, they figured out that uh, Bitcoin moved up this ladder uh, by an increased stock to flow ratio on the right hand side, such that right now it's around 30. And once the Bitcoin halvening takes place in May this year, then by definition, the ratio is around 48, something like this, um, not meeting gold yet, uh, but slightly below our goal. So then, according to their logic, Bitcoin would be the second uh, uh, scarcest asset on the world after gold. Yeah, that's their logic. You can dispute it, of course, but I think it's interesting to at least uh, think about their logic because it's interesting uh, to observe. Yeah, that's it. Uh, I personally think that Bitcoin is an interesting uh, future. Uh, once people understand that it's a scarce asset, once there is pressure on people's wealth because of inflation. So I could imagine that Bitcoin uh, could develop quite positively because of first halvening, because supply is shortened. And second, uh, because people increase their demand uh, due to the cr uh, crisis coming up. But I would also expect that this is only happening, say, around the second half of this year or even later when people more and more and more understand what Bitcoin actually is. I hope this wasn't too long, uh, but um, I hope um, there have been some interesting insights in here. Perfect. So, yeah, thanks, Philip. Um, it was a splendid overview, when, especially when it comes to the uh, evaluation and the stock to flow or flow to stocks setup. It's uh, especially interesting, and in particular when you want to have a comparison, which is uh, scarce. And um, yeah, um, from this side of the perspective, switching from the academia side uh, to the practical side of the business, and especially when it comes to um, maintaining um, and basically buying or selling crypto assets, in particular um, Bitcoin, as um, we've talked about today, especially about Bitcoin, it would make sense to um, having a look at about institutional infrastructure. And as we heard by uh, Christian by today in the beginning, there's a lack of um, infrastructure. And beside the lack of infrastructure, we find a um, very uh, scarce market, especially when it comes to fragmented liquidity. So um, having that said, um, you have to know that there are more than 500 cryptocurrency exchanges out there. Um, in addition to that, uh, several DX, right, um, decentralized uh, exchanges. And in this particular case, it is interesting to pool the majority of the liquidity into a funnel, right? A funnel that can be utilized, um, for instance, for institutional traders, especially uh, when you're on the buy side. Um, for instance, if you're an asset manager, bringing in the crypto assets or digital assets in particular within your portfolio, for ins instance, within a satellite, um, exposure for your um, clients. It is interesting. And uh, what we established within um, block size capital is the right infrastructure and not only the right infrastructure in terms of technology, but also um, the compliant um, processes and all the regulatory umbrella side. So it's uh, fair to say that uh, within partnering within the securities trading bank from Frankfurt, we are um, able to provide the fully digital assets brokerage by now. And this is interesting especially if you come from an institutional background, uh, an eligible counterparty, meaning a company, um, asset management company, buy side asset manager, for instance, or uh, hedge fund, or even on the investment banking side. It could be uh, also focused on external asset managers, um, but it's not our key, key focus. And without further ado, let me quickly show with you the, the flagship product, which is Block Size Core. Um, and what you can see here by now, um, is block size matrix with in 
which is a correlating um, or corresponding front end for block size four, right? So um, it, this is a standard uh, dashboard that you're using to um, basically visualize the recent positions, uh, recent crypto assets. You're able to switch uh, dedicated positions in particular. And um, by the way, we will be um, afterwards able to answer a few questions, not only to, to my side, but also to Philip and Christian. Um, I think we will have a couple of, of uh, minutes left, so I'll make a quick wrap up. But um, yeah, so what you can see here um, is also several kind of charting opportunities that you can customize in your favor, right? Um, in addition to that, you find several other uh, relevant charting options, so for instance, like the standard candlesticks, nothing that is too exciting that you haven't seen already um, in market overview, and especially interesting right now, the heat map um, visualizing that, a bit, especially Bitcoin uh, cash right now is under pressure due to the, the recent halving uh, yesterday, right? So there's an interesting setup that you can directly see here. And there's further more statistics, um, but it's, that is not too uh, important right now. Um, let's quickly have a look at the market because that's what um, we're keen to see right now, all right? So first of all, um, starting within the portfolio overview and um, as, as we said in the beginning, um, what, is, what we have in a lack of infrastructure is not only a lack of um, infrastructure in terms of interfaces, not only the interfaces that are missing, for instance, the banking standard interfaces when it comes to fix are not given, um, usually at least. Um, we have additional problems, especially when it comes uh, problems in the markets or hurdles in the market when it comes to um, institutional adoption, especially when it comes to the layer of having an homogeneous infrastructure, right? So because each and every provider uh, got its own data format, unique data formats, which uh, deviate a lot. Um, this is true on the position side. This is uh, true on the trading side. And this is obviously also true on the custodian side of business, right? So what we did is mm, we established um, an overall holistic view of your crypto assets portfolio. Um, which is for the, the asset management side um, in an AV view, which is nothing else than a net asset value proposition, right? Or net asset value calculation. And on um, your personal side, you're able to link in your uh, dedicated wallets, which could be your paper wallet on, under your pillow, but it could also be your HSM based um, wallet in a secure crypto asset storage, right? And you buy here, you have an overall visualization of your total holdings. You're able to select the reporting currency, um, which is right now in, in Euro, as you can see here, and several crypto dedicated positions are aggregated uh, on the left-hand side, as you can see here on the pie chart. And uh, you're able to drill down the dedicated positions. For instance, what we can see here in um, our demo portfolio is that you have dedicated Ether positions and dedicated uh, several wallets, which are combined in this overview, right? So I, uh, you can see the visualizations on um, by the rem our remote Zoom session, and in particular, you're able to add ded dedicated wallets. So the idea is to bring in your own wallets on one hand side, and also having um, yeah, basically one one touch point for your treasury or cash management um, position management, right? So that's the the core idea. Assembling all the crypto assets into one particular place and one holistic place, um, which enables you to have the, the reporting. When it comes to post-trade reporting, um, bear with me a second, I will um, be there in a couple of, of minutes. But first of all, we deep dive into um, the market side, right? The market depth to be precise. For instance, we haven't only visualized the standard order books that is this is not rocket science, right? But what we have done in particular is um, aggregated order books or what we call it layered order books. So, um, the reason for that is simple because we used to uh, assemble them anyway. We used them for smart order routing. So what we did is basically um, aggregate several, in this particular case, four um, exchange order books for Bitcoin, um, Bitcoin as um, a base currency and Euro as a currency that um, you find in one chart visualized here. So what you can see in particular is not only, once we zoom in, you see a dedicated overlap, not too much right now, um, but you see a dedicated overlap, as you can see here, which is in particular your spreads, right? The spreads um, over inter-exchange um, spot prices 
um, that can be used for arbitrage, right? So this is your arbitrage opportunity right now, as you can see here. There's several other uh, exchanges and pairs available. You're flexible on your choice here, and um, you see the recent positions in a holistic overview, which is also aggregated on the left-hand side, and you see some calculations on the lower right side. Um, you find, for instance, statistics like the highest um, bid, the lowest ask, um, which is basically an, a global aggregated overview, which leads us um, to the use case, which is um, obviously utilizing that for um, two things. For one, it, when you will be able to have a marketplace or market making in particular. Um, but what is even more interesting for us is enabling institutional players like um, our connected partners. Um, and we mentioned in the beginning, partners like Avalok, Queerlogix, for instance, or trading technologies to bring in an aggregated um, smart order of view. And um, I can show you that to you in a second. So imagine you're a buy side asset manager having an accumulated um, demand right now for, let's say, about 300 um, Bitcoin and your cold currency would be euro since your settlement would be in euro and you would be um, in particular, your settlement instructions would be on, on the euro side, you have usually a bank wire, um, which is in, in the SWIFT parameter, right, uh, on the banking side, and you're able to simulate, for instance, in this particular case, this order, so you're able or free to switch this, since it's a demo, of course, we will have in the simulation mode, obviously, active, right, and we are able to uh, execute a 300 Bitcoin order and with, with real real-time aggregated order books um, via our smart order router. You can also route it to dedicated exchanges, but obviously the, the usage and the more fun is it, it is to having the aggregated way, right? And we're um, one here having the best way of uh, the type. There are several order types available right now. We're focusing on the market orders, right? So um, it's in buy order, as you can see here, and um, you're able to validate your order before you send it. Um, and be advised, this is not the only opportunity to bring in trades. Um, for instance, there's also an trading front end, which is able um, enable you to bring in your API connected trades, right? Or trades via APIs. But let's execute it for now and have a look how the markets will look like in this particular case. And um, it's kind of interesting to see that it is not only uh, executed in an immediate response time, which is uh, usually below 100 milliseconds, but what you can see here um, is that the order sliced accordingly, right? So we have um, the majority right now at Bitstamp. Um, they have Coinbase in small slice within Kraken and also Bitcoin got a major share of uh, one fifth of the overall order. And um, what you can see here furthermore is um, that you calculate an average execution price. This is in particular important if you compare that, um, especially comparing that to the volume weighted average pricing, similar to, to MIFID 2 regulatory, MIFID and MIFID 2 um, post trade uh, performance, uh, which is usually done within the standard benchmark uh, KPI, which is called volume weighted average pricing. So it's the same implementation on our side. Um, of course, we're not in the crypto asset side, um, not forced or enforced to having this side, but we're doing that anyway to bring in the transparency uh, for the post trade lifecycle. So um, what you can also see here is a unique order uh, ID aggregating the, the four orders in this particular case. And you see a dedicated order status for each and every exchange. Um, as you can see by now, we obviously we connected a far more in, um, exchanges, but not all of them provide um, the Bitcoin Euro pair, right? It's um, usually five for, for six, especially for Bitcoin Euro, um, a bit more broader market for US dollar or other cryptocurrencies in particular, and um, yeah, the order is usually executed um, in a sub second or even 100, below 100 milliseconds uh, parameters, uh, usually fast round trip times. We are actually able to propel um, the low latency uh, infrastructure, or actually the low latency execution of the trades via the st uh, static routed, um, static routed private net, um, which is not an, a VPN, um, but it is actually a physically static round net, which we are able to use within the parameter of one of our, our trading partners, and which saves us um, about, for the route London and New York, which saves about um, 20 milliseconds, which is, um, doesn't sound a lot, but it's uh, basically, you know, 
the red rays of the HFTs, the high frequency traders, right? So this is in particular one of the unique advantages here. And um, yeah, of course, on the regulatory side, you, you are basically focusing on what is in for the savings side. Um, if you would compare, this is important, no, not just right, if you would compare this trade to the most expensive price within the market, you would have saved uh, almost 7% of the overall order, which is stated below here. Maybe you can see my mouse as I'm speaking here. So this is a dedicated um, saving in particular with regards to the most ex expensive exchange, right? So this is an advantage of this model of routing. Um, and usually the prices and the deviations vary a lot. Um, and the calculation is basically um, deviating a lot, especially when it comes to the more liquid markets. But in comparison to the most um, the most expensive exchange that uh, 7% is per your case. Um, yeah, very interesting setup. And let's have a look about um, the next trading history, especially when it comes to the trading requirements um, and trading requirements in terms of uh, trade blotters or the post-trade um, transparency. So if you um, are not only on the uh, execution side and not an HFT or not an hedge fund, Usually, um, you have the brokerage setup or asset management setup, and you have um, to implement a dedicated um, yeah, trade history, or let's call it trade blotter, as the colleagues usually um, used to say, right? So what is implemented by here is that you can see a dedicated solution for bringing in the order and having an, a complete log over the last, um, or last hundreds of orders. Um, you're also able, which is even more important, the dedicated um, PDF report, um, it's a monthly report basis. You're able to download them here, right? Um, and in addition to that, um, which is also kind of interesting, that you basically are able to bring in all the intraday reports and live basis within a dedicated parameter. By here, for instance, you're able to switch the date and then um, have a dedicated export for in the CSV file, um, which is usually required for this our standard Excel, right? So this is basically the, the overall round trip. Um, and when it comes to obviously observable server statistics in this particular case, which are relevant, um, in addition to that, um, you can show dedicated metrics with regards to the connectivities of the order books. What we can say is um, that incorporating all the exchanges and they're um, up to 70 are now connected on a technical level. Um, and all of the order book updates would incorporate um, a pro the pro or require a processing of about one, 1 billion per day order book updates per day, which are incorporated and processed and stored in our um, query DB um, in the long time, right? So this is, an, yeah, as you can imagine, a major effort and um, requires a lot of uh, processing in the backend side. And this is um, speaking of the backend side. It would be interesting for you um, to understand how it look like, looks like in this particular case. Um, and yeah, uh, basically to wrap up, uh, it's I think a good good idea to explain how the overall infrastructure is working in this particular case, right? So um, on the left hand side of this overall architecture, you can see financial institutions, which is um, your banking side, hedge fund side or by asset, asset managers um, connected by a dedicated and uh, unified API or a standard interface, which is nothing else than a computer programmed interface, right? We also provide a REST-based interface, um, like state of the art, and a fixed-based interway uh, gateway, which is divided into two parts. One is the market data gateway, and one is um, the execution uh, fixed gateway, right? And this is um, the like, client side parameter. Um, which will be connected, for instance, um, through your banking parameter and by, for instance, the standard core banking of the solutions of, for instance, Querlogix or Avalog, right? Their core banking um, setup is connected and you're able to connect via these, these multiplier. And within our parameter, you can see two further important things that on the other end of the spectrum, we connected several liquidity providers like exchanges, dark pools, OTC desk, et cetera, et cetera, and unify them with different data formats and different, um, yeah, different APIs, which for instance, contains also web sockets, usually, but not often, or not necessarily, um, and connect them into a unified layer, which is called block size connect, 
right? Um, and it's a fault tolerant and completely cluster based um, Kubernetes cluster, ensuring 99% um, uptime uh, all over a year. Usually it's, it's better, but that's guaranteed by our SLAs. And um, in the middle, of course, you can see the functionalities that I've shown during the last 10 minutes, right? The smart order routing in particular, um, the aggregation function, the market data, and some analysis features, right? So aggregate and layered order books, for instance, et cetera, et cetera. And um, yeah, that's basically the overall infrastructure. Um, of course, there will be kind of some questions in particular. So, but first of all, let me close this overall setup here with a dedicated um, where can you find us, where can you contact us, if that is of interest. Um, quickly jump through the Connect Us site. With, um, basic, we are based in Frankfurt, uh, Townsend, where is central. Also a small outpost in, in Singapore. And um, you can obviously drop us a note here or um, as also written down in the chat, um, what you can see here is our standard info. Um, if it's block size capital um, address and yeah, obviously feel free to drop us a note. Um, in, after our session, I will um, also paste in the LinkedIn account links within the chat feature. So you um, feel free to, uh, yeah, the Divinos or link is uh, post us on LinkedIn. And um, yeah, so that's it basically from, from my side. Feel free to, um, if we have the time left, um, we can bring in some questions, right? Mm, but that's basically it from, from my side. Do we have a spontaneous question? If someone has a question, please raise their hand so I can unmute you. Perfect. And by the way, um, thanks, Luisa. And in addition to that, thank you for organizing this uh, perfect setup. I really love the format. And um, having Corona right now in, uh, in charge or in take in place, it is a perfect setup. So. Yeah, as promised, I will post um, right now as we speak um, the, the recent LinkedIn profiles of Christian, um, Philip, and myself. And feel free to, to contact us. And yeah, in the meantime, if you have a question, um, feel free to raise your hand and uh, Luisa will um, unmute you. And by the way, uh, please feel free to drop us a note. If you are interested in the presentation, um, we are more than happy to provide that, um, especially on the, the blog size side. Um, so I will just drop you the info address. And feel free to contact us via info at blogsize.capital. So Luisa, do we have some questions? No, not yet. No one has raised a hand. So I think you can proceed. Yeah, yeah. basically we're finished, uh, as mentioned. Um, yeah, so feel free to drop us a note. We um, will plan to be finished at 7 p.m. So yeah, perfect timing. And um, it was a pleasure to uh, be your host.